Well, it is a beautiful Lord's Day, and it is the start of a new calendar year, of course, as we have noted. That means it's a time for reflection, a time for looking ahead. Sometimes we look back as the year passed, and we look ahead to the year that awaits us. It's a time for really thinking in terms of beginnings, new beginnings. And as we think about beginnings in this new year, I'd like for us to think about the Bible as a book of <coughs> beginnings, and especially the book of Genesis. As Ian read in our hearing before Bible class, uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering upon the face of the waters. Then the Lord said what? Let there be light. And there was light. And he saw that it was good. He separated the light from darkness. And the, uh, the darkness he called night. The light he called day. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And then he goes on and everything is good throughout that creation process. And then in verse 31, he looked upon all that he had made and behold, it was very good. So, in Genesis, we have the beginning of the creation account. And I appreciate the uh, song we have just sung. This is our Father's world. Although most people in the world, many do not recognize it as being the Father's world. The evolutionists certainly don't. They don't recognize God to be in the picture at all. Not at all. But Genesis is the beginning of the creation account, the creation of the world. But it's also the beginning of the family and the home. And of course, uh, God created man and made him from the dust of the earth, took the rib and created Eve. Why did he do that? Because in Genesis 2.18 we're told that, that it was not good God saw that man should be alone. So he created a helper, as the New King James says, comparable to him. And as you've heard before, that, that <coughs> bone was not taken from his foot so, so that he could uh, uh, walk on her. <laughs> it was taken from his side. She was to be a helper comparable to him. Yes, there are restrictions to the roles that women play as far as the church and relationship to the husband, but she is comparable to him, a help me, a help comparable to him. So Genesis is the beginning of the family and the beginning of the home. But tragically, Genesis, as we see in chapter 3, is also the beginning of what? Sin. That's where sin entered the world, where he saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, that it was a tree desired to make one wise. And she ate of it and gave her husband to eat of it as well. There you have the three avenues of sin that, that John describes in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And she succumbed and sin entered the world. So three beginnings that I'd like for us to concentrate upon as we begin this new year. Think about these three important beginnings as we begin another year on this earth. And the question we first ask is, how will we begin this new year as far as our relationship to the world is concerned? I mean, will we, as we have just sung, will we never take for granted the beautiful creation and the design that demands a designer as we see it all around us? Will we realize, as the psalmist wrote in Psalm 19, that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork? Day unto day utter speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. That's a passage that says no matter where you are and what language you speak, there's one language everyone can understand and should appreciate, and that is, that is the creation and what it tells us about God. God created the world in the beginning for the good of man, and yet man tragically has allowed the world to overcome 
him rather than his overcoming the world. In John chapter 16, in the midst of that treatise that Jesus delivered shortly before his crucifixion to his apostles, in chapters uh, 15, uh, 14, 15, 16, through there, he talked about the relationship at times that his disciples would have with the world. And much of what is in these chapters pertains only to the apostles. In other words, when he tells them that the Holy Spirit is going to guide them into all truth, that's not a passage or a promise for us today. That was for them. The Holy Spirit has guided the apostles and other inspired writers into all truth, and we have it today. We have it in written form. But there are some things that obviously we can see and make application from that he said, them. For example, in John 16 and verse uh, 33, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. And then he added, In the world you will have tribulation. But then he said, Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus said to his apostles, and thus obviously it does have application to us, In the world you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Why? Because no matter what that tribulation is, no matter what form it takes, no matter what degree you suffer, because Jesus has overcome the world, through Him we can overcome the world as well. And so that's very reassuring. Some other passages pertaining to that relationship that we sustain to the world. In Matthew 16, 26, Jesus said, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and what? Loses his own soul. For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And then we go back to that context of John 15 and 16 in that area, in John 15, 19. Here's what he assured the apostles of. He said, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you were not of the world, but I have chosen, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. You know, when I was looking at this passage again, I thought, is there a time, is there a time in which we've ever lived in our lives that that statement is truer than it is today? When you think about that. Listen to it again. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Now tell me, in today's society, who is it that loves its own? It's this woke mentality. It is this, it is this extremist uh, arm of society that loves only those who love what they love. What they love. And they will, they will not, and I think I've mentioned this before, they will not let you live your life and do what you want to do as long as you'll just leave them alone and let them live the way they want to. That is no longer true in a great portion of our society. What is true is that they want to live the way they want to live and they insist that you either live that way also or they're coming after you in every way that they can possibly come after you. Amen. That is where we are. And so as I thought about this verse that Jesus, this statement of Jesus to his apostles, I don't believe there's ever been a time when that's truer than it is right now. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And they hate you, ironically, in the name of hate. What do I mean? They mean that anything you say against them, against what they endorse, what they practice, what they approve, that, on your part, if you criticize it, is hate speech on your part. It's a definition of hate that is totally false, obviously. But that's where we are. That's where we are. So, how do we live in that world? Well, we live apart from that world. We live, as Titus 2.12 pointed out, and we mentioned in Bible class, we live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age regardless of what others are doing in this present age. Now, have we 
spent this past year the way we should as the world, <coughs> as, uh, as far as our relationship to the world is concerned. That's something to reflect upon. That's something to reflect upon. Have we maintained that separation from the world as we should? Satan will use devices that are subtle and effective to warm us up to the world, so to speak, and to worldliness, and ultimately <coughs> cook us. It's the frog in the kettle syndrome. In other words, put a frog in a kettle of boiling water and he'll hop out if you don't put a lid on it in a hurry. Put him in cool water and warm him up slowly and ultimately you can cook him because he doesn't realize what's happening to him. That's the phenomenon that is at work by Satan in this world and Christians are not immune to it. Obviously not. In fact, he's not going to work on those who are, he, he already has in the world. It's the Christian that he is going to concentrate on. So we have to make sure that we've spent this past year as we should have in our relationship to the world. And most importantly, how will we begin and spend this year as far as our relationship to the world is concerned? Remember what James wrote in James 4.4, 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that Friendship of the world is enmity with God. Therefore, whoever makes himself a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Now, that's the last thing on earth I want to be, is an enemy of God. And I know that's true of you here. But we cannot, we cannot allow what happened to Eve when sin was introduced into this world to happen to us. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, or the pride of life. Remember that John in that text in 1 John 2, 15 through 17 and verse 17 said and the world is passing away and it's lost but he who does the will of the Father abides forever. And I think I've mentioned before that it's interesting that that tense that John uses there is a very specific tense. The world is passing away. What he's saying is that while we live in this world it is even now passing away. Now, has that been proven scientifically? It has. The second law of thermodynamics, or the law of entropy, says this universe is like a giant clock that has been wound up and that it's unwinding ever so slowly. Not perceivable to the naked eye, obviously, but there's less and less usable energy in this universe as was here when it was first created. John says the world is passing away. Does that comport with that scientific truth that has now been discovered? Indeed it does. In fact, there's never been a true scientific proof or fact that has been uncovered that will contradict this book. Never. Everything here will completely harmonize with any true fact of science. Why? Because this is from God. This is from God. But next we ask, how will we begin this new year as far as our families are concerned? As far as our homes are concerned? Well, how much time will we spend thinking about admonitions concerning the family and the home, such as Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 24? A very familiar text to you, I'm sure, where the admonition there to wives is submit to your own husband as to the Lord. While well, the husband is the head of the wife, is also Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be subject to their husbands in everything. Do we believe that passage? Surely we do. Therefore, we must live in harmony with it and make sure that 2023 is no different than 2022 if we have been living in harmony with that passage in the past year. And if not, then make the necessary corrections. A similar admonition is given to the Colossians in Colossians 3, 18. And then in Ephesians chapter 6, as we come back to that epistle, in verses 1 through 4, there the family relationship is very clearly set forth once again involving the children as well. Children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with promise that what? That it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And then what about fathers? You fathers provoke not your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture or the training as the new says and the admonition of the Lord. So 
where we have children in our home still, we must keep that admonition in mind and follow it to the fullest extent possible. We live in perilous times, to say the very least, as far as the family and home are concerned. This woke mentality to which I've alluded in reference to the previous point is very much concentrated on destroying the home, destroying the nuclear family. They have to destroy it for their agenda to be achieved and to be accomplished. They have to remove God from society. They have to destroy the family as we know it. That's why you're seeing all over the country these drag queen shows that are ironically called family friendly. There's no such thing as a family friendly drag queen show. Those two things are completely exclusive, mutually exclusive. How can there be anything? And yet, that's how they are billing it because they want to redefine the family completely and totally. So the women's live movement, uh, and the women's live movement to a great extent, there are many feminists who are now rising up against what has become more extreme than the women's live movement itself, as it began, ironically. There are feminists who are liberals who are outraged over the, over the degree to which things have gone in terms of the destruction of the home and the family. So we have to ask, how about us and our families? Are we valuing our time together? Are we spending time together in prayer? Are we, are we interested in Bible study, not only in every opportunity that we have to bring our children to Bible class, but are we interested in Bible study with them at home? You know, I think about family devotions, and they're good, and there's nothing wrong with that at all, but our family devotion time doesn't need to be just confined to a specific period of time necessarily. What does Deuteronomy 6 talk about? When you will, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you have every opportunity that you have to influence your children and teach them lessons that may rise up on occasions when you're out shopping or something. There are times when we need to take advantage of every opportunity to instill the love of God and Christ in the hearts of our families. And then third and final question in terms of these beginnings that we introduced at the outset of the lesson, how are we beginning this new year as far as our relationship to sin is concerned? Are we beginning it in sin? Hopefully not. But if so, we need to have the courage and the honesty to, to rectify that. Are we faithful in our attendance at every opportunity that we have to be with brothers and sisters in Christ? Are we indifferent at times to the Lord and His work? Uh, are we living in sin because we put off obeying the gospel of Christ? If we have not expressed our faith in Christ, repented of sin, confessed Him to be the Christ, been buried with Him in baptism for the forgiveness of sins, then we are still in sin. And there are so many so many in the denominational world, obviously, as we've alluded to many times, who were basically endorsing people remaining in sin. How are they doing that? By telling them that all they have to do to get out of that sin is to pray a simple prayer. To simple, simply give mental assent to the fact that Jesus is the Christ, invite Him into your heart, and that's all one needs to do. That's totally opposed to what the Lord said and what everything in the New Testament teaches about what one needs to do to become a Christian. Sin is responsible for the heartache and the despair that comes to all men at some time or another. But most of all, it was sin that what? Caused our Lord to suffer the very things that we've observed as we've remembered this day here and how horrific that was. It's unimaginable to me the kind of pain and agony that our Lord endured so that we could be relieved from sin. And it is so tragic that there are so many false teachers in our world claiming to be followers of God who are leading sincere and honest people astray by telling them 
that all they have to do is pray this prayer. How many times, and I do not doubt his sincerity at all, but how many times during this holiday period have you perhaps seen on your TV Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham, coming and telling you Jesus loves you, that's true. <coughs> Jesus wants you to be saved, that's true. But then telling you there, if you'll simply pray this prayer with me as he recites that prayer, and then now if you've done that, and you need help, Paul, because you're now a Christian. I'm sorry, I don't doubt his sincerity or the sincerity of anyone who follows that teaching or teaches that, and there are many who do. It is totally contrary to what the Scripture teaches about how one becomes a child of God. And so, we cannot be duped by Satan or those who transform themselves into apostles of light, as the Scripture tells us many do. We cannot allow that to keep us in sin and not to be free from it by the only process that can free us, and that is simple, sweet obedience to the gospel of Christ. Believing that Jesus is the Christ, John 8, 24, unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins, Jesus said. But how can it be belief alone when Jesus also said, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish, Luke 13, 3. And again, repeated those words in verse 5. So it can't be belief alone if Jesus said you have to repent. But Jesus also said, whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before the Father who is in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, I will deny him before the Father in heaven. Matthew 10, 32, 33. And how many times have, have the words of Mark 16, 16 been quoted? He who believes, Jesus said, and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. And I mentioned, I think, before, some said, well, he didn't say he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe and is not baptized will be lost. I hope he shouldn't have said it. Why? Because if you won't believe, then being baptized is not going to be any good in any way. It would have been nonsensical for Jesus to have said that, and he never said anything nonsensical at all, just the opposite. So, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. I've mentioned the simple formula, I was terrible in math, but I know this one. B plus B equals S. Belief plus baptism equals salvation. But those on TV and others who are saying, pray this prayer, here's their formula. B equals S plus B. In other words, belief alone equals salvation, and then you can be baptized, but not for forgiveness of sin. That's totally foreign to what the Scriptures teach. And so, this is the time to begin. But what better time then to begin your new life as a child of God if you have not done that. What better time to begin again to live the Christian life if you have been unfaithful in some way to the Lord in a public way. You see, we better think about beginnings today because there is coming a time when we will face the end. And therefore, we must think about beginnings. And one final question. How will you begin this year as far as your relationship to the book of beginnings is concerned. That's something we need to make sure we determine. Not just to read, even daily, but to truly study daily and apply to our lives. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come now as we stand and sing.